Tonight, we have a special guest with us. Uh, Rob Bowen has spoken to us here before, spoke on North Mormons uh, a while back before I think any of you were here. Um, and then uh, he spoke to us again about the uh, problem of the evangelist. What about those people who've never heard about Jesus? Uh, and then, uh, most recently, he spoke to us about Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Rob has done a lot of research and spends his life doing research on Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. And so he knows a lot about these topics. In Mormons, uh, it, Mormonism is the topic that he's going to speak to us tonight about. So um, I think he's got an hour and a half to talk about Mormons. How could he possibly do that? Yeah, it is a problem because not because he doesn't have enough things to say, but because there's so much that could be said about Mormonism. Um, so, with that being said, I'm just going to let Rob go with this. And, uh, so, I'm going to let Rob up to speak this for me. This works all right. I'm going to stand over here so I can walk down to the uh, slides here. Uh, let, me, let me just introduce myself a little bit. Uh, yeah, my name is Rob, and I am the executive director of the ministry that's uh, in Cedar Springs now. It used to be in Grand Rapids. Uh, Cedar Springs is about half an hour north of Grand Rapids, and it's called the Institute for Religious Research. We have a website, IRR.org, that uh, will show up at the end of the uh, presentation on the screen. IRR.org. And I've been there a little over eight years. The ministry itself is much older than that, about 25 plus years old. And the main thing that we do at IRR is address issues pertaining to Mormonism and Christianity. We also have resources on Jehovah's Witnesses and some other subjects. But uh, Mormonism is the main driving issue for the organization. It was founded by a businessman whose nephew joined the Mormon religion about 30 years ago. That started. Um, my training, uh, I am a biblical scholar. I have uh, my uh, doctorate online uh, in, in biblical studies, but uh, with a twist, I did a PhD dissertation on the uh, Book of Mormon and looked at how it uses the Sermon on the Mount in the Book of Mormon. So the, the relationship between the Bible and the Book of Mormon is a special area of interest of mine, and more generally the Bible and, and Mormonism, uh, and even more generally than that, looking at groups like Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, Mormons, Pentecostals, etc., and how they uh, handle the Bible in their various different ways. Uh, so as a, somebody who's trained in biblical scholarship, I uh, try to bring that uh, perspective to bear in dealing with these groups. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about me and what I do. Uh, we're going to talk about Mormonism. There is way too much to say in an hour and a half. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero in on the origins of the Mormon religion, focusing almost exclusively on the period of Joseph Smith himself, the founder of the religion, and the origin of the various scriptures of Mormonism. Mormonism has uh, various additional scriptures that they uh, believe are the word of God alongside the Bible, and in some ways uh, superseding it, although they wouldn't normally put it that way. And so we're going to look at that. And along the way, we will touch on various doctrinal issues that come up in Mormonism. And one thing that this will do is it will help to answer the question, why is Mormonism so confusing? Because it is. And I will be confess to you that it wasn't that long ago that I was in the same situation of saying, I don't even understand. What do they really believe, and why don't their statements about matters that they agree with one another? They don't even seem to agree with one another. Well, taking an historical approach to the subject of the origins of the Mormon scriptures helped me to understand uh, why there are apparently conflicting beliefs being articulated by Mormons, even the same Mormons, and how they try to put it together. And so the 
foundation of that is all found in Joseph Smith. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we will try to uh, uh, touch on other aspects that are interesting uh, to people about Mormonism as, as we go along. We'll see how that, how that works out. Now, before we really dive into the subject matter, I want to make clear that uh, we're, we're, uh, we don't want to act like uh, you know, the, two, uh, the two old geezers in the Muppet uh, show that are always heckling and, and, and kibitzing and criticizing whatever was being said. Uh, the goal here is not to uh, just attack Mormons or criticize them, uh, but it's to understand uh, what they believe, understand why they believe it, understand what this is really all about before we try to express disagreement or criticism. Uh, Proverbs 18.13 says something like, He who answers a matter before he hears, it is a folly and shame to him. In other words, if you criticize somebody before you understand them, you'll just look stupid. That's what it basically means. So uh, my, my goal and what I do is to try to understand what people are saying first, and then if there's something there to disagree with, go ahead and disagree, but I don't necessarily disagree with everything. We'll find out as we go along what is right in Mormonism and what is not. Our goal, of course, should be to speak the truth and love. We don't want to compromise either one of those uh, in, in anything that we do. Now, just a little bit of background or some quick facts just to help people understand what we're talking about. You probably already know something about Mormonism. It was founded in 1830 by Joseph Smith, Jr. Uh, the official name now is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're commonly known as Mormons or Latter-day Saints or just LDS. Reminds me of the famous, uh, to me famous, maybe not to you, but the, uh, maybe the infamous scene in uh, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, where uh, Captain Kirk uh, uh, talked about his friend supposedly doing too much LDS at Berkeley. <laughs> you, know, you had the wrong thing there. So LDS is an acronym, obviously, for Latter-day Saints. Uh, they, they got started in uh, the uh, Northeast, in uh, New York, upstate New York, and in Ohio, but eventually uh, became headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. There are approximately 15 million members worldwide, uh, a little bit over half of that now outside the United States. Uh, many of those are inactive or barely active. And there are, and this figure changes and fluctuates up and down, but last time I checked it was something like 75,000 missionaries. And uh, if you're having trouble keeping straight the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Mormons are the ones that ride around on the bicycles, uh, the white shirts and the little badges. Uh, the Mormon missionary, uh, Mormon, male Mormon missionaries are called elders even though they're all about 19 or 20 years old. And the uh, female missionaries, and there are an increasing number of those, are called sisters. The reference to 19-year-olds as elders is one of the, is an example of a very significant phenomenon in Mormonism, which is it uses a lot of Christian terminology and redefines almost all of it. <laughs> because obviously in the Bible, an elder is not a 19-year-old kid fresh out of high school ready to go to evangelize. Joseph Fielding Smith, and you probably can tell that he's related uh, to Joseph Smith Jr. Joseph Fielding Smith said, uh, a later uh, president and prophet of the LDS Church, Mormonism, as it is called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. He was either a prophet of God, divinely called, properly appointed and commissioned, or he was one of the biggest frauds this world has ever seen. There is no middle ground. Now, I can totally agree with that statement. There is no middle ground. Uh, Joseph Smith cannot simply be a good Christian guy who got a few things wrong. Okay? Mormonism will not accept that assessment of him, and neither will non-Mormons once they get to understand what Joseph Smith is really all about. So uh, it really does come down to the story of Joseph Smith, and that's why we're going to be looking uh, at his story excuse me, from start to finish in order to understand Mormonism. Now, Joseph Smith was born in late 1805 uh, in Vermont. His family uh, moved to upstate New York when he was a teenager. Uh, they were dirt poor most of the time and struggled 
badly. Uh, his parents were what was called at the time primitivists, uh, and another term that sometimes gets used is restorationists. Primitivists believed that Christians had lost their way and they needed to restore primitive Christianity, that is, original, unadulterated, uh, unpolluted, pristine Christianity. They needed to go back to the religion of the apostles and live the way the apostles lived and teach what the apostles taught and do what the apostles did. And if we could just do that, these people believed, we could have, you know, real Christianity in our time. Unfortunately, instead we had all these denominations and all these doctrinal squabbles and everybody disagreeing with everybody. And we would just like to have everybody get together around the simple, and usually this is how it's understood, the simple gospel as contrasted with the complex theological whatever of traditional Christianity. Joseph and his family lived in upstate New York in part of what was known, became known by historians as the Burned Over District. Now, what does that mean? It means that this he lived in an area which was especially uh, affected by a revivalism of the so-called Great Awakenings in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Great Awakenings were revivalist movements that sought to bring uh, nominal Christians to sincere, uh, zealous, committed faith. Because almost everybody in America was a Christian, on paper at least. But they weren't necessarily living a Christian life. Uh, and so they, they were very often not going to church uh, and, and not doing anything that would mark them as Christians, but they were by, by default thought of as Christians simply because that was the culture. And so revivalism was an attempt to kind of wake people up, hence the Great Awakening, from their, uh, their, their uh, spiritual slumbers and get them on fire uh, for God. And uh, upstate New York was the scene of an awful lot of this. Revivalist preachers would come through town and they would put up tents and whatnot and they would preach to the people and they would call people to... Uh, repentance and faith, and, and so on. So this is the culture in which Joseph Smith lived. There's a lot of, there are skeptics, there are uh, Unitarians who believe in God, and not the Trinity, and not Jesus being God. Uh, there are uh, a, a little, a little bit of Catholicism in these areas, but not much. Uh, most people are Protestants, or they're disaffected Protestants. They kind of think along the same lines theologically, but they, they can't commit to any church because they're not really happy with any of them. Uh, and that's a very typical uh, stance that people had at that time. That might sound a little familiar because that's a growing phenomenon today as well. A lot of people who profess to be Christians, but they're not comfortable being a part of any particular group of Christians. Now, <clears throat> In the 1820s, Joseph, as a, as a teenager and a young man, Joseph got involved in what was commonly known as money digging, uh, basically searching for buried treasure. And in 1822, or thereabouts, probably that is the right year, Joseph found a rock in his neighbor's farm uh, that uh, they called a peep stone or a cedar stone. Cedar stone is the more respectable sounding name for it, but it's essentially called, known as a peep stone. And in some of these cases, a peep stone was literally a rock with a hole in it that you looked through. Uh, and what they did with these peep stones or cedar stones was that they would search for buried treasure with them. Uh, the farm, uh, the neighbor whose farm Joseph found the, uh, the stone at, uh, Chase Farm, and one of the Chase family members, Sal and Chase, had her own cedar stone. And the story is that Joseph borrowed her stone to look for the tree. 
the treasure uh, on the farm. Later on, the story is told, oh, no, he was helping the neighbor do the well. And they just kind of the farm was wrong, but they, they were doing this very respectful thing of helping him to build a well. Probably they were actually looking for more magic rocks or, or seer stones. In any case, Joseph claimed this particular stone was his that they found on the farm uh, when they were digging uh, there, and he kept it. Now, throughout the next five or six years or so, for most of that period, Joseph did a lot of digging for treasure or a lot of directing other people where they should be digging for treasure. And the way he would do this, and the way Sarah Jakes did, was the same thing. And not just buried treasure, also lost items. If he lost something, he supposedly could help find it. He would, he would take the stone, and he would put it inside his hat. And he would bury his face into the hat, so that the outside light was blocked. So. He couldn't see anything outside, no light was coming in from the outside, and nobody could see what was in the hat. Now, I think that was the more important part of it. And so he would say that the, the rock would start to glow and give some kind of directions or some kind of information that only he could see because his face is buried in the hat. And so this is how he would search for buried treasure. And in fact, at one point, he was hired uh, by an individual to look for a silver mine uh, using his uh, peach stone and hat. In connection with that, he was uh, charged with a misdemeanor uh, for his activities because uh, in New York, it was uh, technically illegal to do this. It was regarded as a kind of fraud to tell people that you could find buried treasure for them or, or lost items for them using uh, a peak stone and charging them money for uh, hiring you to do this. Now, this is a picture of the, uh, the stone, the seer stone. The Mormon church finally released a picture of it, or pictures of it, in 2015, so just last year. Uh, According to most historians and scholars, including Mormons, uh, Joseph probably had uh, three or more cedar stones, but this is the famous one. And they knew about this, they knew where it was, they had it in a vault, and they kept it under wraps uh, for you know, well over a century, closer to two centuries. And then last year, they released photographs of it and allowed people to see what it looked like. Now, during that expedition that I mentioned to find a lost silver mine, which, by the way, they found no silver, uh, Joseph found a wife instead. He was staying at, they were staying at the house of somebody that lived nearby where they were doing the digging. The guy was renting out rooms to them uh, while they were do, doing their expedition. And his daughter was a young lady named Emma. Joseph and Emma fell in love. And uh, uh, they eloped because uh, his father, her father, Isaac Hale, uh, disapproved of Joseph's venture. Apparently, his money was good enough, uh, or the, the expedition's money was good enough for him to allow the people to live in his home temporarily, but he wasn't, it wasn't good enough for him to actually marry his daughter. Uh, and so Joseph and Emma eloped uh, at the beginning of 1827. Now that year and that date is somewhat significant because it's to keep things in order in the story. When he eloped, he had nothing, basically. And he and Emma went back to Emma's father, Isaac, and basically asked him to tell him. I'd say hat in hand, but that might be a little bit before we're doing it. Um, and Joseph promised he would stop digging for treasure if Isaac would help them financially get, get on their feet, which Isaac did. So that was early in 1827, not long after the book. Now, less than a year later, half a year later or so, September of 1827, Joseph claimed that he had found buried treasure. <laughs> Only this was a very different kind of buried treasure. He claimed that he had found a stone box 
very near his home, uh, his family's home near their farm, uh, containing gold plates and other artifacts. Um, now, later on, the story was told that he had been told about these gold plates and everything else by an angel who had been appearing to him since 1823. So if you go back to what we said earlier, he started looking for buried treasure in 1822, 1823, after he found the stone at Chase Farm. He's digging for buried treasure, and later on he tells people throughout that entire time, this angel was appearing to him on an annual basis to instruct him and get him ready to become uh, the translator of the Book of Mormon. But he's still doing all the treasure digging throughout that period of time. Makes you wonder why uh, he would do that if he had already been commissioned by an angel of God to do this very sacred and religious thing. Now, for two years, between almost two years, between September 1827 and uh, about June, May or June of 1829, Joseph wouldn't let anybody look at the plates. Now, he'd have them, apparently, with him. In some cases, they would be sitting on a table covered in cloth, but you couldn't actually see them. And some of the guys uh, that he knew would say, oh yeah, I was allowed to lift them, sort of heft them, and feel their weight, and then put them back down when I couldn't look at them. And in fact, Joseph told me, well, if you look at them, God will strike you dead. Yes? I'm sorry, sorry. No problem. Can you, um, are you going to make the slides available to us? Uh, well, all of this information uh, in one form or another is on our website, not in the slideshow slide presentation. I guess I probably should put this online sometime. <laughs> I haven't done that. I haven't put the slideshow online. That's a good idea. Um, we, could, we could make that arrangement, though. Uh, but, uh, yeah. I, I'm one of these guys, I'm always tinkering with something and I'm not ready to let it go. And <laughs> But I should do that. I should put this online because I think it might be helpful to people. So, uh, for most of that period, nobody was allowed to see the plates, although they were told that they existed. And in some cases, they saw something that was supposed to be some kind of pile of plates that they didn't get to look at. As I said, in later accounts, Joseph reported that he had been shown where to find these plates by an angel of the Lord named Moroni. Moroni was identified as the last author to write on the gold plates before they were buried near Joseph's farm. Joseph, in the official account, and a couple of accounts earlier do some of this, say some of this, he claimed that Moroni first appeared to him in his bedroom in 1823, four years before he got the plates, uh, three times throughout a single night tell him basically the same thing three times. By the way, um, you see this picture here, Moroni sort of floating in midair there uh, by Joseph's bed, and Joseph is in bed apparently by himself. Uh, we, we happen to know uh, that Joseph lived in a very small uh, cabin, very, very small house uh, with uh, seven or eight siblings and his parents and they had basically two little bedrooms, and everybody was doubled up on the beds. There were two or three people to a bed. And there would have been four or five boys in the room throughout the night, in addition to Joseph. There would have been at least three or four in addition to Joseph. The angel appears in the room, blinding light, illuminates the entire room like it's the middle of the day, talks to Joseph for quite a while, disappears, comes back and says the exact same thing over again, and does it a third time. And there's no mention of this in the account. And in fact, the way Joseph talks about it, it sounds like he's the only one who sees any of this. Raising some interesting questions about how that happened, and is that, is that really credible? I have a question. Yes. Um, this is my question. Was the number three the um, significant, like this, the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, there, there's no specific explanation that they've offered for the three appearances. 
Uh, now, you can find trees in the Bible, of course, all over the place, but it's, it's a matter of, you know, is there really some intentional connection between any of those and what we find in here? I would say not. The real significance of this is that there is a, a kind of a motif or an, uh, an idea that shows up in Anglo-American literature in the 18th or 19th centuries, and in, and in just sort of what their equivalent or their pop culture, of spirits appearing to people in the night three times, or having three spirits appear to an individual throughout the night. I'm sure you can think of at least one story about that motif. <laughs> exactly, a Christmas carol. Now that happens to be, I don't know, 20 years after uh, Joseph Smith's story would have taken place, or even after he told the story. So, no, we didn't get the idea from Dickens, but Dickens didn't get the idea from nowhere either. It's part of this cultural, you know, notion of uh, spirits, especially spirits connected with some kind of treasure, although that's not the case in the Dickens story, uh, appearing to uh, an individual at night, and, and there have been three of these appearances. So that appears to be the actual reason or where this idea comes from. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, sidebar, for sure. Now, so it's uh, late 1827, Joseph says he's got the gold plates. And uh, he copies, he says, some of the characters on the place, which again nobody else has seen, on a piece of paper, and supposedly with a translation of them, although that turns out probably not to be the case. According to the official account that Joseph Smith himself composed years later, in early 1828, Joseph's main financial supporter, a farmer named Martin Harris, took this piece of paper to New York City to get the characters authenticated by real scholars. And so he went to go see a couple of these scholars, and one of them, in particular, there's a story told uh, called about Charles Anthon. Now, Charles Anthon was a real scholar. He was a classic scholar. He later on did some big dictionary. And uh, so he was, a, he was a bona fide scholar. And Harris showed Anthon a piece of paper. Everybody agrees on that because Anthon agreed that that happened. He was shown a piece of paper on which were markings that did not correspond to any known language, according to Anthon. Uh, and in fact, even according to Joseph Smith's later uh, version of the story, Anthon didn't recognize it as being any one particular script. And yet, according to Joseph Smith, Anthon not only said that the characters were authentic in ancient characters, he even authenticated Joseph Smith's translation of the characters, which Joseph Smith identified as a, a modified form of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Now, one wee little problem here. In 1828, and for quite a few years after that, nobody in the Western Hemisphere could read Egyptian hieroglyphs. The Rosetta Stone had only recently been partially interpreted in Europe by Champollion, a French scholar. And the interpretation of the Egyptian hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone eventually led to a kind of cracking of the code of Egyptian hieroglyphics, and eventually people were able to make sense out of it. But in 1828, nobody in America could do that, not even Charles Anton. So there's no way he could have authenticated these characters. This is a picture of a piece of paper that uh, a breakaway church from the uh, Utah-based uh, LDS church has in their possession that is at least a copy of the characters that Joseph Smith apparently wrote down, uh, or drew, and on this piece of paper there's no translation, and it's unlikely that there was a translation, Anthon didn't see one, according to Anthon. So, it's a big problem. Uh, right here, and this again is in the official story in one of the Mormon scriptures called Pearl of Great Price, in a little short book in that collection called Joseph Smith History. And it doesn't even make sense. 
But in any case, uh, Anton uh, said something to Martin Harris that Harris took as confirmation that there were ancient characters on it. He probably said something like, yeah, this looks like it could be a Greek letter here, and that over there might look like a Latin you know, thing. Oh, OK, well, that's ancient. You know. so apparently, it was good enough for Martin Harris. So he went back and he financed the translation, which Joseph Smith said he was going to do by looking through stone spectacles that had come with the gold plates in the stone box. Now, at first, Martin Harris served as Joseph's scribe. He took down 116 pages of dictation. Harris took those pages home and lost them. Now, the story here is Martin Harris's wife, Lucy, did not believe in Joseph Smith at all. She was convinced he was a con artist, he was defrauding her husband of money, which he was, frankly, and she wanted to see the plates. No, absolutely not. You're not going to see the plates. Well, I want to see the translation, at least. And Joseph's own story, his own version of the story, is that he asked God three times, can I let Mark Harris take the translation home to show Lucy? And the first two times, God said, no, supposedly. The third time, God said, okay, but you can only show it to Lucy and these other four members of your family, nobody else. Martin Harris takes the pages home, invites his friends over, says, hey, look what I got here, and shows them the pages. You know, yuck, 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 talks it up, brags about how, how much help he was with Joseph doing all this. Well, the pages then start twisting. Nobody knows what happened to the pages. One theory is somebody stole them. That's the traditional Mormon explanation. Joseph Smith's own explanation was unscrupulous people who wanted to oppose the work of God had stolen the pages in order that if Joseph tried to reproduce the translation, they could then show up with the old version, which in the meantime, he said, they were a doctor to make it look like it said something different. And I will be shown to be a fraud based on their chicken. And so that was his theory. And he stuck to that. The usual theory by non mormons and there are some ones who rationally admit this is possible, is that Lucy took the pages out of the drawer and she burned them. Well, it's been nearly two centuries and the pages have not shown up. The second theory was more likely to be the case. <laughs> In any case, Joseph had a real problem here. Because he had claimed that the words in his dictated translation were divinely revealed to him, basically word for word, through the stone spectacles. So he should have been able to reproduce the lost text. And if somebody had the pages that were modifying them, that would have been visible. So that's, they were written in ink. It's not going to be, not going to be able to do that. So he had kind of a dilemma. Well, to address this dilemma, Joseph issued his first revelations apart from the Book of Mormon text. In these revelations, he claimed that God had foreseen thousands of years earlier. You know, he had foreseen the loss of the pages. He had known that wicked men were going to steal the pages and alter them. So now this is not just Joseph's theory. This is now inscripturated in a revelation, supposedly, that Joseph simply received from the Lord and dictated that God knew, God knew that wicked men were going to steal the pages and, and change them. And so God had one of the ancient prophets write an alternate history, a parallel but different account of the same events, so that Joseph could dictate a translation of the second account, and it wouldn't have to say exactly the same thing as the account that it got stolen or lost. Now, the lost pages never turned up. Joseph was never able to find out what happened to them. Now, just remember, Joseph had a seer stone, or a peak stone, find lost stuff with it. He had regular discourse with an angel, and he received divine revelation from the Almighty, Omnipotent, and Omniscient Creator of the Universe. And he just couldn't find those missing pages. 
He could find gold plates that had been buried for 1,400 years, but he couldn't find 116 manuscript pages that had been lost for only a few weeks. Now, I'm just going to I'm just going to be blunt with you. There are some things that Mormons have offered some pretty plausible sounding explanations for. This isn't one of them. I have yet to see a plausible explanation even within a Mormon framework, because they believe that God is omniscient. They believe Joseph talked to angels. But God, instead of just telling Joseph, no, don't let Martin take the pages home. They're going to get stolen. They're going to get burned. Or whatever the heck happened to them. God says, okay, go ahead and let them take the pages. I just happen to have another version of the story right here in case what happens is going to happen. This does not sound like any kind of God that Mormons or Orthodox Christians believe in. The whole thing is so convoluted. This is just one example of the very confusing and convoluted stuff you get into when you study Mormons. Well, Joseph is done having Martin Harrison subscribed, and in 1829, after a long hiatus from the translation effort, for various reasons, some of which were, were not anything except tragedy and a child die and so forth. And in 1829, a school teacher named Oliver Cowdery became Joseph's scribe. Together they produced the completed manuscript of what became known as the Book of Mormon. Um, Joseph and Oliver produced this manuscript in about two months. It's a long book to dictate in two months. That's an impressive accomplishment. If Joseph did it the way that we are told, it's a very impressive accomplishment. But how did Joseph do it? And why was the process so much slower with Martin Harris than it was with Oliver Cowdery? These are the kinds of pesky questions that Columbo might ask, or uh, whoever your favorite TV detective is. Well, how did Joseph translate plates? Well, this picture you see here on the left is how the Mormon church has depicted the translation process until recently. You see Joseph and his scribe sitting together at a table. Joseph is reading the gold plates. He's got his finger on the gold plate. He doesn't even have any stone spectacles on in this picture. He's just reading the plates and apparently receiving divine revelation as to how to translate the words that he's looking at and touching with his finger on gold plates. Now, the witnesses, and most of them gave their testimonies about this years later, but there are many of them, and they're consistent. The witnesses years later said, no, Joseph translated the Book of Mormon, he dictated the Book of Mormon by putting the stone spectacles or his seer stone, they differ on this point. Usually it's just one stone, the seer stone. Into his hat, put his face into the hat to walk outside light and see the words in English through the stone and dictate them out loud. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what Joseph did when he was directing people where to find their treasure. That's what people did when they were doing it. He just used the same method, according to the witnesses, to dictate the text of the Book of Mormon. Now, did he dictate the entire text of the Book of Mormon that way? We don't really know. We don't have a day-by-day -day account of Joseph's translation work. Today, I translated Mosiah 2, 1 through 1. There's nothing like that. Uh, so you have to do some kind of inferences from the little bit of information you do have as to what he was doing on various days, as to where he might have been in the translation work. It is quite possible that on occasion, Joseph and Oliver got together and dictated and rewrote down a bunch of the manuscript without anybody watching. We don't know. There's one reason why I think that happened. A great deal of the Book of Mormon is copied from the King James Version. And the most likely explanation is that Joseph dictated it with the King James Bible in his hands, reading aloud from it and changing whatever he felt like he wanted to change as he went through it. 
Mormons don't like that theory, but there's good empirical evidence to support it. Now, at the end of the translation work, right about the time that they were finishing up, Joseph had already clued in his friends and family that three people were going to be permitted to see the plates. It was even written into the Book of Mormon that three men were going to be able to see the plates. And so he had Joseph's friends were saying, can I be one of those guys? Can I, can I, can I see it? And so Joseph eventually picked the three guys. Uh, it was Martin Harris, the farmer who was backing him financially. Uh, David Whitmer, uh, who was the, it was in his home, his father's home, where they were doing most of the translation work, and, and uh, Oliver Cowdery. So, uh, they, these 11 men said that they saw the place three uh, on one occasion, and it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I'll skip over all that. Three, three, these three guys, and then later on, eight more guys, mostly from Joseph Smith's family and the Whitmer family. In fact, all of them really were from the Smith and Whitmer family, the eight. And they would say, uh, they, they apparently signed an affidavit. We don't have a copy of the paper with their signature. But uh, apparently these, the 11 men signed these two affidavits saying, yeah, we saw the plates. And the eight men actually said they not only saw them, they got to hold them and look at them and touch them and so forth. Now you may wonder, well, what happened to the plates? Yeah, we all wonder that. Because after the plates were translated, uh, they were gone. Uh, did the angel Moroni I take them to heaven? Did he rebury them somewhere? Uh, later on, there are stories told about a cave in which the plates were kept, along with a whole bunch of other plates, wagon loads full of plates. That's that's not my term. That's their term. Wagon loads full of plates. The sword of Laban, which is a, a, a sword that is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and all this other stuff in the cave. It's basically a cave of wonders. And and Joseph supposedly uh, took the uh, Book of Mormon plates, the gold plates, back into the cave and, and left them there. That's one theory. Nobody knows what that cave is, by the way. And uh, suffice to say that even some Mormons have essentially admitted that there's no literal cave. Now, if it, we, we're, we're told what the dimensions of the plates are, we know what the size of the stack of plates was. And if you assume that they're gold plates, they should have weighed about 200 pounds. Uh, we should make it very difficult for Joseph to run through the woods, uh, fending off attackers who wanted to steal them from him, according to one story, while carrying the gold plates under the other arm. Now, you say, well, Samson was strong. Yeah, there's nothing in the account that suggests that Joseph was given superhuman strength. That would be what is known in philosophy as an ad hoc assumption. Uh, if Joseph said, I felt the strength of ten men, he doesn't say that. He's, he's running through the woods with the plates under his arm. Probably they were made out of tin. That's that's my theory. Um, they say, well, what do you base that on? Well, his father had a shop, a metalworking shop, a cooper shop, on a farm where they worked with tin plates. So it's it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty decent hypothesis. Now, what's in the Book of Mormon? Well, the Book of Mormon is basically uh, a, a group of 15 shorter books. Uh, most of them here, I think, I'm not going to take the time to read those, but I want to read the highlights. Basically, the main storyline of the Book of Mormon is about a group of people descended from a patriarch called Lehi, who takes his family and another family and maybe some other people on a journey out of Jerusalem through Arabia across the oceans to the Americas about 600 years before Christ, right about the time the Babylonians were sent to destroy the Temple of Jerusalem. Uh, and they settled in the Americas, and they were fruitful and multiplied. And they became uh, two major peoples called the Nephites, who were usually the good guys, and the Lamanites, who were usually the bad guys. And uh, Lehi's son, Nephi, who's the first of several individuals in the Book of Mormon called Nephi, Nephi uh, writes down the first major chunk of the Book of 
more. He then passed on the gold plates. He then passes the gold plates to his brother Jacob. Jacob passes them down. It's usually father and son, occasionally brothers and brother or something like that. And uh, they're passed down down the centuries. The Book of Mormon is very careful to construct what in legal terms would be known as a chain of custody. Where did these plates come from? Well, Nephi made them. He wrote on them. He gave them to Jacob. Jacob wrote on them. He gave them to Enoch. And all of them goes. So we have an unbroken chain of custody. And the finally, uh, Moroni got the kind of last place last. He buried them. And then 1,400 years, he showed Joseph where to find them. So that there's this unbroken chain of custody of what happened to the plates. Joseph Smith and Mormons in general do not like ambiguity or questions about scripture. Where did it come from? Who wrote it? When did he write it? Where was he? Well, where? You don't have to worry about that. But the rest of it. In the Bible, it's annoying, right? The Bible authors almost never tell you where they are. We assume, you know, often, wrongly, or at least questionably, that if a book has somebody's name on it, he wrote it, but he might not. Do you think Samuel wrote first and second Samuel? Not necessarily, it doesn't say that. It's about Samuel and other things that happened during his lifetime, hardly. So anyway, the, the Bible leaves a lot of unanswered questions. And that's one of the things that people didn't like about the Bible in Joseph Smith's day. There were all these unanswered questions. Biblical criticism was beginning to percolate. They didn't have all that stuff that we have now on that subject. But it was beginning to bother people that we didn't have answers to these questions about the Bible. So Joseph produces an alternate scripture that he has all those questions. We know exactly who wrote every single word of the Book of Mormon. Now, these, these men who wrote the, and they're all men, by the way, who wrote the books and passed the plates down from generation to generation, they were all prophets. They were all Nephite prophets. That is, they were all descended from Nephi. At least that's the usual understanding. They were literal descendants of Nephi. And some of them were called and during the period of the, uh, uh, the first century, after Christ died and rose from the dead, he went to the Americas and preached to the Nephites at one, outside of one of their temples. And he preached the Sermon on the Mount, as it reads in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, with a very few changes. By the way, that, that was the subject of my dissertation. It was the Sermon on the Mount in, in 3rd Nephi in the Book of Mormon. Uh, Jesus appears to me by his preachers to them. He quotes Malachi to them, because they didn't have Malachi, because they had left before Malachi had a chance to write it. So he quotes a couple of chapters of Malachi for them. He also quotes some Isaiah, which they had that. And uh, he starts a church, just like he started a church in, in, in Jerusalem. The church, in everything that was good about the church, Palestine or, or Roman Palestine, it was much better in the Nephi country. They had everything in common, and not just for you know a few weeks or something in Jerusalem, but everything. And there were no ites of any kind. In fact, the Book of Mormon actually says that there were no ites. We all they're all just one. Okay, it was paradise on earth for about two centuries, and then people got a little bit proud. They got a little bit too materialistic, and it all crumbled. And the church became apostate uh, in the third and fourth centuries, just like it happened in Europe, according to Mormon beliefs. Christianity became apostate in the fourth century, Constantine, all that terrible stuff. And the same thing happened in a different way in the Americas. So there's a collapse of the, of the religion, there's a collapse of the culture. The Lamanites, who were the bad guys, come, make a roaring comeback just for a while there were no ice of any kind. Now the Lamanites again. Oh, by the way, the Lamanites, they always had the dark skin. Lamanites were cursed with dark skin. Just so you could tell them apart. They don't know who the bad guy. They didn't have black hats and white hats, so just think of the skin color. So the Nephi, the Lamanites defeated the Nephites. They they wiped them out. The last the, one of the last living uh, Nephites was Mormon, whose book is named after. He is the author of over 50% of the Book of Mormon. His son, Nephi, takes the plates from him 
finishes the law, includes a story about people before the Lamanites and Levites even came, uh, called the Jerobites, uh, who came to the ark as the time of the Tower of Babel. And uh, so he adds, adds some other things at the end in a book called the Book of Moroni, and he buries the plates in the early 5th century AD. So that's the basic storyline of the Book of Mormon. Now, the Book of Mormon is a kind of a strange book. On the one hand, if I may be blunt, the Book of Mormon is a fraud, and it is the foundation of a false version of Christianity. It is the foundation of a heretical Christian movement. Just, just tell me what I think, I'm just being blunt, okay? On the other hand, there's a lot to say that's nice about the Book of Mormon. It contains a lot of Bible in it. People say, you know, the Book of Mormon, it kind of sounds like the Bible. Well, in a lot of places, it is the Bible. Because Joseph Smith copied about 27 chapters of the Bible into the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon exalts Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. Most of what it says about Christ, Christians would agree with. Oh, how can you say this book is not of God? Look what it says about Christ. This is how the Book of Mormon says. See, so here's what happens. The Mormons come to the non-Mormon Christian and they say, you need to read this book. This is lost in book. This, this book is getting You're going to know Christ like you've never read before. Well, I was told that book was on the devil. Well, it can't be on the devil because look at all these things that it says about Christ. It's all about Jesus. The book, the book of Mormon talks about Jesus more than the Bible does. And that's true. <laughs> so, it, the, the, the non-Mormon Christian starts reading the book of Mormon. It's like, man, this sounds great. I don't know what my friends were telling me. When they said that this was not of God, I mean, this is obviously, you know, Christ honoring book. They, they, the whole problems, all the problems of the book just fly right back. They have no idea. And they are hooked because this sounds so good. It sounds so, so Christian. Even the Old Testament prophets, that is the prophets during the Old Testament period, the Book of Mormon, even they are Christians. They even talk about Jesus Christ by name, predict that he's going to die and rise from the dead. In exactly those words, I mean explicitly, literally. This is what's going to happen. They tell, they talk about John the Baptist, they talk about Mary, by name. And it's all so much clearer than the Old Testament prophets. I mean, poor Isaiah. There will be this servant, and he will suffer for his people. And who is the servant, you know? No, there's no, there's no ambiguities like that in the book. Except when it's quoting the Old Testament. This is one of this is one of the things that my research uncovered that have not been talked about before. If you're reading through the Book of Mormon, you're reading the Nephite prophets talking in their own diction, in their own, you know, doing their own thing, saying their own things. They talk about Christ explicitly, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to do this, do that, and he's going to be very, he's going to be uh, baptized at. Uh, you know, Bethany, you know, Bar, you know, they give the name, it's right after King James and all this stuff. So, but then Nephi or whoever, Jacob, whoever says, I'm going to quote from Isaiah. And he quotes Isaiah. And he's quoting Isaiah 7. You know, about the virgin and being a child and all his name, Emmanuel. Uh, and he quotes Isaiah 9. You know, his, his name, a child will be given to us, a son will be born to us, his name will be called. One of the counselors of Isaiah 11, the shoot from the stem of Jesse. Same thing as it says in the King James Version. Isaiah 53, the serpent servant. Same thing as it says in the King James Version. No references to Jesus by name. Nothing explicit. No explicit references to the cross. No explicit references to the resurrection. Then as soon as the prophet, the Nephi prophet, is done quoting Isaiah, he goes back to talking about Jesus by name. He already knew by name. Like he's a Methodist, which basically Joseph Smith was. So the Book of Mormon sounds really good because a lot of it is people ask me, do you think the Book of Mormon is the work of God? I say parts of it. Because parts of it are cribbed out of the Bible. When Joseph produced the Book of Mormon, as I said, he was basically kind of a Methodist with the, you know, some twists. It's basically a Methodist. His theology was still broadly Christian. Uh, he didn't have a very high view of the Bible. Uh, and he wrote those into the Book of Mormon. 
The Book of Mormon is nothing if not anachronistic. Ancient Nephite prophets are worried about things like stuff getting lost in the manuscripts of the Bible. People teaching Unitarianism and Universalism and Calvinism and paid clergy and all these other things that people worried about in 19th century America. And supposedly these are these are ancient Israelite prophets living in you know, Central America or something, 2,000 years ago. Well, one of these things is the Nephi says that plain and precious things were removed from the Bible. And, uh, and even criticizes the Christians who will speak to Mormons in their day by saying, we don't need anything outside the Bible. We've got a Bible, that's all we need. So Joseph writes into the supposed prophecies of these ancient prophets a translation of a text nobody has ever seen, except Joseph, which is real, predicting that people will ridicule the Book of Mormon because it's something we don't need it because we already have the Bible. So he anticipates criticisms and he answers them right there in the text of the Book of Mormon. And there's many examples of that. That there's some 40 places in the Book of Mormon where the author, whoever the author is supposed to be, says, I'd really like to go into more detail on this because I, but I can't because it's just not room because I'm writing these precious metal plates and there's not much room to go into that. Sorry, love to. Now they would just stop saying that. They would have had room for a whole new book for the book because they do say that a lot. Mormons view the Bible as more reliable, the Book of Mormon as more reliable than the Bible. Articles of Faith, which is one of the Mormon scriptures, is taken from a letter Joseph Smith wrote a couple years before he died. Articles of Faith number eight says, we believe the Bible is the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. You will notice there's no qualification about the Book of Mormon being translated correctly because it is assumed that it is translated correctly because it was supposedly translated supernaturally by the victim power of God. Ezra Taft Benson, one of the 20th century uh, Mormon presidents and prophets, said, unlike the Bible, which passed through generations of copyists, translators, and corrupt religionists who tampered with the text, the Book of Mormon came from, one, from writer to reader in just one inspired step of translation. Now, I've already kind of stolen my own thunder here a little bit because I and just I said talked about this before we got to it, but one of the things that was supposedly lost from the Bible was Old Testament clear Old Testament prophecies about Jesus Christ. And as I pointed out, there are very explicit prophecies about Jesus in BC prophets among the Nephites according to the Book of Mormon. Here's an example from Mosiah chapter three where Mosiah, uh, where I think this is Benjamin talking, says he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and his mother shall be called Mary. He goes on a very explicit. By the way, the thing about him being the Father of heaven and earth, the Book of Mormon, at least in parts, talks about Jesus as he is the Father and the Son. Very controversial because other parts seem to distinguish uh, them. It, it's, it's interesting. So this is an example of the explicit Nephi prophecy of Jesus hundreds of years, or at least in this case, over 100 years before uh, Jesus was born. There are a lot of Old Testament chapters in the Book of Mormon. Here's a quick list. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm not going to give you time to write all that down, but uh, you can see mostly it's Isaiah. There's a few places elsewhere. The Isaiah passages are what interests here, us here. Here is a table showing references to Jesus by name or title in the Book of Mormon. The first row here is before Jesus came, outside of Old Testament quotations. And you can see the, type, the names or titles, Jesus, Christ, Messiah, Son, and also Lamb, Lamb of God, or just the Lamb, it are found hundreds of times in Nephite statements before Jesus came. Uh, Old Testament quotations from uh, before Jesus came, nothing except one passing reference to the name of Christ, and it doesn't have anything to do really with the coming of Christ. This is talking about Joseph Smith's incident with Charles Anton, the you know, classic scholar. After Jesus came, not Old Testament quotations again, hundreds of references to Jesus, but no reference to the name of Jesus, no 
use of these other titles to set that one cast of reference to Christ, and no explicit descriptions in the Isaiah prophecies quoting that in the Book of Mormon about the cross, the resurrection, Mary, John the Baptist, or any of that stuff. Now, you say, well, maybe the text of Isaiah was changed. Well, as we've already seen, if it was, the Book of Mormon missed it. But the Dead Sea Scrolls have pretty much settled that issue. Because there's a couple of uh, scrolls of Isaiah, most notably what's called the Great Isaiah Scroll, uh, that date from a thousand years earlier than our previously early manuscripts of Isaiah. And they agree almost word for word. And certainly, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls version of Isaiah does not have Isaiah talking about the cross and Bethany, Young Jordan, and Joseph, you know, in these explicit ways that you find, uh, or not Joseph, but Jesus in this explicit way that you find in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon Old Testament quotations include an average of 96 out of 100 words in the King James corresponding chapter of the Bible. 96% of the words of King James in these chapters are reproduced verbatim in the Book of Mormon. If you then include uh, variant forms, synonyms, and things like that, it's going to go up to about 98%. But just verbatim exact words, 96%. Just to give you an example of why that's so significant, it isn't anything close to that when you compare the King James Version to the New King. It's nowhere near 96%. The Book of Mormon chapters of Isaiah are closer to the King James Version than any modern English translation, including the New King James Version. The only explanation for that is that the King James Version was being used somehow. Now you've got to make a decision. Is God choosing to reveal to Joseph Smith through the stone and the hat the words of the King James Version? even if it's not exactly a literal translation of what's on the gold plates? Or is Joseph Smith using a Bible? Now, for various reasons I won't go into in detail here, the second answer is by far the best. But even if you didn't know all the other stuff I might go into, the idea that God is deciding to reveal to Joseph Smith the words of Isaiah in the King James Version is very ad hoc. Yeah, that is, it's just, you're just saying it because that's the only way you get out of the problem. There's no independent reason to think that's the case. Remember, the Book of Mormon was originally written on gold plates by Nephite prophets whose original language was Hebrew, but they're writing in Egyptian. Okay, then Joseph Smith is receiving a revelation word for word of the translation in English of what's in the Egyptian text, which is a translation of the Hebrew text of Isaiah. But it comes out exactly like the King James Version, 96 plus percent. Now, where did the Nephites live? You might be wondering. I mentioned that the Book of Mormon is not very particular about the where, except that it's in the Americas. The traditional view of Book of Mormon geography was that it took place essentially throughout the entire Americas, throughout the entire Western Hemisphere. The Book of Mormon refers to a land northward, a land southward, and a narrow land of land connecting the two. Now, I can't assume this anymore, but it used to be I could assume that everybody would immediately recognize that as a description of the Western Hemisphere. Fortunately, geography is what it used to be. But you probably all figured that out immediately. As you can see, we have what appears to be a land northward, i.e. North America, a land southward, i.e. South America, and a narrow land that appears to connect them, i.e. Central America. This was the dominant view among Mormons for about a century or longer. There were, were suggestions uh, that it might have been confined to a smaller area, but they weren't sure which area that was. One reason why they held to this hemispheric model, if you will, is that the Book of Mormon was found in upstate New York. So that would seem to have to be part of the land of Oxford. Or at least one of the lands, if it's a land southward, the land northward must be really north. Another reason why they thought that this was correct was because Joseph said that the American Indians were Lamanites. 
And I say, well, we could just talk about, uh, you know, maybe forget his half that day or something. It's in the Mormon scriptures. In one of the scriptures called Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph commissions various Mormon uh, leaders to go preach to the Lamanites. And, you know, like in Ohio. <laughs> okay, so it's American Indians. Now, uh, the, uh, the dominant view now is called the, usually called the limited geography theory, according to which all of the Book of Mormon story, once they get to the Americas, takes place in a very small region of Central America, essentially southern Mexico and most of Guatemala. And that's it. Until the very end, when Verona leaves the Book of Mormon region and he walks for however many years and buries the place in upstate New York. But everything else in the Book of Mormon story, once they get to the Americas, takes place in that region of Mesoamerica or Central America. Now, not everybody goes along with this. There are Mormons who vigorously oppose this and argue that the Book of Mormon story took place in the heartland of America. It's called the heartland region. Or in the Great Lakes region. Uh, and the Great Lakes would be the four seas. Almost everybody's abandoning the hemispheric model because of various problems that we've got with it, uh, but they can't decide, they can't agree on where it took place. Now, the dominant theory of the Mormon scholars and intellectuals is that it took place in ancient Mesoamerica. But there are some problems with this claim. First of all, uh, we now know, and we've known for a long time, that ancient uh, the ancient Americas, all of the Americas, including Mesoamerica, were populated by people who came across the Bering Sea or the Bering Strait thousands of years earlier than anyone in the Book of Mormon is supposed to have gotten. Uh, roughly 9,000 BC, but you can push it back even further, but it has to be no later than about 9,000. They, they spread throughout the Western Hemisphere, and in ancient Mesoamerica, various peoples emerged to develop civilizations. The two predominant ones were the Olmec and the Maya civilizations. And there are learners today who will try to correlate, roughly at least, the Jaredites, the people that came over after uh, the Tower of Babel, with the Olmecs, and the Nephites with the Mayans. Now, there are a number of reasons why this won't work. One of which is the Olmecs started about a thousand years or so before Christ. But people had been there for thousands of years before that. And they're just their descendants. They're not different people. They didn't show up on a boat somewhere. Another problem is that the Mayan civilization, and this is really the key doesn't fit the Nephite culture at all. According to the Book of Mormon, the golden age of the Nephite civilization was in the first two centuries AD, when it was basically paradise on earth because everybody was a Christian. Then there was this apostasy, and by 300, 400 uh, AD, everything was falling apart. But when everything was falling apart, according to the Book of Mormon, that's when everything was starting to go really good in Mayan culture. That's when they were making all these wonderful buildings and the, you know, the temples and everything, and the dramatic uh, uh, structures and uh, you know, riches and, and serious government and uh, layers of, civil, of, of, uh, of society and so forth. Their, their golden age started about the time the Book of Mormon says the Lamanites took over and became a bunch of savages running around half naked eating meat, raw meat. And that's, that's, that is how the Book of Mormon portrays the Lamanites, and again, the Lamanites are the Indians. So according to the Book of Mormon, the Lamanites, that is the Native Americans, have dark skin, and they're savages. They run around, you know, doing whatever. And so there's this very stereotypical view of Native American peoples, written by the Book of Mormon, 
But according to the Book of Mormon, that all started about the time that the, we now know from archaeology, the, uh, the, the uh, Mayans who really get their culture going. Now, the Book of Mormon is a, a basic element of the Book of Mormon, obviously, is metallurgy. Because there are gold plates on which are written this hundreds of pages long book, right? When do people in the ancient Mesoamerica begin doing any kind of serious metallurgy? About 600 years after Christ. And by the way, even then, they're not writing long books on Christ. They never did that. The Book of Mormon has metallurgy taking place over a thousand years before Christ. That's a huge mismatch. And again, the kind of metallurgy required for the Book of Mormon itself never took place in ancient America. Yeah. I have a question. Um, that was an earlier question. I have to go to this way. Um, but my, first, well, my question is um, that <coughs> when they transcribed those hieroglyphics, yeah. they made sure that it was actual Egyptian. Like, did they prove that that was actual Egyptian? You mean that when Joseph Smith copied the characters? I'll take the first. Yeah. In fact, we have a copy of the paper, at least that we think it's probably a copy, not the original. But in any case, it's certainly not Egyptian. Because you know, like you know, old, like so you couldn't compare it to any it's, simple. It's thing. not any language known to man. Not any language. No. Okay. Some characters you could, with imagination, say, well, that, that could be the letter, you know, English H, you know, K, and Hebrew. This letter over here could be a P or Chinese and Greek. You know, like, I mean, you could do that, but I mean, a lot of it's just squiggles that don't match any known language. Now the Mormons have an explanation for that. Too bad the Book of Mormon has an explanation for that. Well, we, we change the characters. And how can Charles Anthony authenticate the characters? Much less authenticate a translation that he never was allowed to see. It's, it's I have another question. Is, is the copy of the uh, hieroglyphics, um, is it on your website? Yeah, there's an article on, on the Anton transcript the, uh, on the website with a picture. A picture of the oh, characters. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And you can find it many places online. It's, oh, it's, okay. it's widely available. Um, I'll skip on the last point. In ancient Mes Mesoamerica, the dominant religious practices and beliefs were polytheistic and idolatrous. And one of the most notable characteristics of their religion was human sacrifice. And when they weren't actually killing people in human sacrifice, they were practicing bloodletting. Bloodletting is basically where you cut yourself in a ritual to try and get the God's attention or something. The Book of Mormon doesn't mention any of that until the very end when the Lamanites take over and fight out all the Nephites. And then you have some references to human sacrifice. And idolatry, but not ever to bloodletting. Instead, the Book of Mormon prophets are constantly vehement against apostate Christianity, Unitarianism, uh, Universalism, which is the idea that everyone's going to be saved, uh, paid clergy, the idea that there's no more scripture that can be added, the idea that God isn't going to work miracles in our day. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Costly and eternal. Now, this isn't a random list. If you had asked an early 19th century Methodist to make a list of all the problems in his culture that were of any kind of religious significance, this is what it would look like. Now, could you find something that kind of spells a little bit like one or two of these in ancient Festival America? I suppose. I mean, there's always parallels to everything, right? But this is a very distinctive constellation of cultural and religious ideas and concerns that are very specific to early 19th century Anglo-American society. By the way, Mormons will say, well, the Book of Mormon was written for our day. The prophets were given a window into the future and they were told what was going to be the issues of the day. Apparently that window was, there was a shave down that prevented them from seeing anything after 1829. So, for example, the Book of Mormon does not talk about higher criticism. It does not talk about evolution. It does not talk about same-sex marriage. It does not talk about nuclear war. 
does not talk about anything anybody's been worried about for the last 185 years. The only explanation for that is that the Book of Mormon was written for Joseph Smith's day by somebody in Joseph Smith's day. I'm going with Joseph Smith. That's my explanation. Yeah. How would you characterize the spiritual mood of the United States in the early 19th century? And I think in terms of like, what the spiritual mood was in uh, late 18th, early 19th century England, where Wilberforce felt compelled to bring about a reformation of manners. What, what was, what we have had all kinds of extremes. We have a lot of skepticism. We have a lot of extremely passionate, you know, fiery, evangelical faith. You have uh, weird communes beginning to pop up, starting their own little, I uh, believe they have to call them cults, I guess. Uh, you've got uh, people trying to find a happy compromise where they can be intellectually respectable, you know, Unitarianism, uh, liberalism, uh, things like that. So you've got a lot of unchurched people who are not only Christians. You've got a lot of people who are church hopping. Uh, you, I mean, it's, it's confusing. It's a very confused society. Part of it is the logistics of getting around and so forth meant that it wasn't quite as easy to go to church. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have cars and stuff. And so if you were working on a farm and you were 25 miles from the nearest town, you're not going to go to church every Sunday. You know, there's that part of it too. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these areas, they are what was then, certainly not now, but what was then the frontier. So you're kind of on your own, and you're just trying to, you know. And let's face it, a lot of these people, and this is why I think they refer to this as the burn corporate district, a lot of these people were burned out on the mission. Somebody was always trying to save them, and they got tired of it. So there's a, there's a every imaginable diversity. Now, there are virtually no Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, very few Jews, there are Jews, not many of them, some Catholics, most places not too many, you know, it's mostly Protestants and no doubt Protestants. Okay. Okay. Maybe you said this, but I missed it. But who originally wrote the Golden Slate? Um, so there's a guy that he said might come to New York and bury him after the late. Right. Night. Right, like that. Uh, but were they carried over on the boat, or were they? The gold plates were made, according to the story, by Nephi, who was the son of the patriarch that led them to the Americas. But he made them in the Americas out of gold, and passed them down, you know, mostly family members over the generations. There are three main authors identified in the book. Nephi, Mormon, hence the name Book of Mormon, and Mormon's son, Moroni. Mormon is writing in the late 4th century, early 5th century. Moroni is finishing that up in the early 5th century. There are a number of other books that are supposedly written by Mormon using source material from earlier copies that he was digesting or, or abridging. Uh, so it gets a little complicated. One of the reasons why it got complicated, which I didn't explain, is the last 116 pages. Joseph had dictated the first part of the Book of Mormon story, and then the pages turned up lost, and he didn't know what to do with it. Uh, so he dictated a parallel account, but before he did that, he picked up the story where more or less where he had left off and dictated from sort of the middle of the story of the Book of Mormon to the end. Then when he reached the end, Moroni, he went back and he dictated first and second Nephi and Jacob and these little teeny little books, ending up in a little short book called The Words of Mormon, where Mormon tells the reader, well, here's what happened. And I had to come up with this other version of the story because God knows why. And that's basically what he says. It's not it's something the purpose the Lord had. 
And so uh, there's the, sub, the second version, and the, it's a more spiritual account, so you're really going to like it. And so he sort of, you know, bridges the gap, bridges the first part of the book, which was really written to last, to the two thirds that come after that little book. One of the funny things about this is, because Joseph did it that way, and he was basically patching things that got messed up, he kind of made a mistake because a couple hundred pages into the Romans version of the story, he has Mormon reduce himself. By the way, I forgot to tell you he has to say that. By the way, my name's Mormon, and I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ and a prophet, and this you know, this is my, you know, stuff that I write. Every other book in the book of Mormon by a different author, the author always starts off by saying, Do you this? And what his relationship is to the previous author. The only one who doesn't do that, ironically, is Mormon. Why does not Mormon do that? Why does he wait until a couple hundred pages into his book to do it? Because Joseph never found the beginning of Mormon's book, and he couldn't replace it. So he had to make up something later on so that Mormon could introduce himself, so the chain of custody would not be broken. I have a whole article on that at one point <laughs> on the website. All right, so that's a little bit about the Book of Mormon. Why spend so much time on the Book of Mormon? Because the Book of Mormon is the gateway into Mormonism for most converts. Mormon missionaries are trained to encourage people to read the Book of Mormon and pray about whether it's the Word of God. And by the way, most of their prospective converts are Christians or people from a Christian background. Yes, if they find a Muslim or somebody who wants to them, they'll talk to them, but mainly they're trying to convert Christians. The Book of Mormon sounds so good, and its theology is so close to Christianity compared to everything else in Mormonism, that it's the easiest way to ease somebody into Mormonism. Once they have accepted that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, they have accepted implicitly that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, because the only way it could be the Word of God is that Joseph was inspired to translate it. But if you accept the Book of Mormon as the Word of God and the translator, Joseph Smith as the translator, then you should accept the church that he found, so then you're Mormon. So it becomes kind of the gateway into Mormonism. Yes. Do missionaries intentionally go out and seek uh, Christians or Christian converts, or do they just so happen to be? Well, that's where they're generally sent. And their missionary pitch, according to the manual that they follow, is really tailored to. Haters, Christians. So rather than starting off with, what kind of God do you believe in? Well, here's what Christians believe about God. Blah, blah, blah. It starts off with, Christianity became apostate and had to be restored in Joseph's name. See, it's the whole, it's, that's less than one. So the whole you know, the structure of the presentation is designed to go after Christians. How much time do I have, by the way? I just been... Well, what time is it? Don't it's watch. it's 8:30 right now, oh, but you gosh. can you can keep you can keep going if you got you got more stuff. But uh, I just wanted to ask yeah. a, a question. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, normally we do open question time at this time, but this this is good stuff. I mean, we don't want to. Well, we finished the Book of Mormon, so that's good. But I at least need to introduce what the others are, so you know kind of what the lay, lay of the land is. So I'll try to do that. Sure. Did you say any other question? Yeah. Well, yeah. I just wanted to say um, the, this first point up here that's uh, populated by people from East Asia instead of uh, Middle Eastern Jewish right. people. Right. That's that's been almost completely confirmed by DNA. genetic. Yes. And the Mormon scholar's explanation for that is yes, the vast majority of the DNA in the Native American populations is of Asiatic origin, and the, the, the Jaredites and Nephites and Lamanites came from the Middle East, but they were always no more than a very small subset of the population in a very restricted area of Mesoamerica. So their DNA basically got washed out by, by them being assimilated into the Native American culture population. That's not what the Book of Mormon says. And I'm, I thank you for bringing that up, because this is a very important point. 
The Book of Mormon presents the Jerobites, the, the Tower of Babel people, as coming to the Americas and settling it for the first time, and it being preserved for them until their culture disintegrated and they died in battle on the hill Kamor. Then, right about the time that that happens, God says, okay, now that those guys are no longer able to have the land because they, they, they messed up, I'm going to bring some other people in, and it's going to be the Jewish refugees from the 6th century BC. So they show up, and God says the same thing to them. This land is a promised land for you. It will, other nations will be kept from it as long as you follow God. Then if you, when you don't, and eventually you won't, then he will bring other nations in, and in the context of quite clear we're talking about Europeans. So the Book of Mormon understands the Nephite and Lamanite peoples, the Jewish people, the Israelite people, who settled in the land, to be the only occupants of the land, for all intents and purposes, for a thousand years, from about 600 BC, to about 8,400, and even after that, they're basically the only people in because they are the Native Americans. They are the American Indians. Then the Spanish show up, and the English show up, and all that, and yeah, so there's a mixture in there, but that's what the Book of Mormon says. It's pretty clear. You can read through the entire, if you read through the Bible, what are you constantly running into? Phoenicians, Philistines, Canaanites, Egyptians, Syrians, Babylonians, you know, Romans, on and on it goes, right? They're everywhere. Everywhere you turn, the Israelites are getting either created by them or making alliances with them or escaping them or something, right? It's an inevitable part of the story. If you're a small population in a much larger civilization where you're not the strongest, you're always going to be the football that gets kicked around. There are no references to any such foreign nations anywhere in the Book of Mormon. Anywhere. Except when it's quoted in Isaiah. Then, all of those references in Isaiah to all the various nations that the Israelites had to worry about in Isaiah's day, they're all mentioned. But when the Book of Mormon talks about what the Nephites had to deal with, no references to foreign powers or foreign nations. In fact, one of the big themes of the Book of Mormon is the fact that the Gospel was eventually going to go to non-Jewish peoples, to the Gentiles. Now, if the Book of Mormon peoples themselves, the Nephites, were Jews living in a predominantly Gentile land, you would think that there would be discussions about evangelizing the Gentile neighbors. But are not. It never happened. So the DNA problem is a real problem. And I have two lengthy articles on our website dealing with that issue, as well as some other articles of relevance. All right. So Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon in early 1830 and almost immediately founded the Church of Christ. That's what it was called at first, then later on became the Church of Latter-day Saints and then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And as soon as he started the LDS Church, uh, he began translating the Bible. Now, what he did to translate the Bible was he took a King James Bible and he marked it up, just you know, by supposed revelation. And uh, so he made various changes to the Bible. The King James Bible. One thing he did in Genesis 50, he had the patriarch Joseph give a lengthy prophecy about somebody who would come in the latter days and he would have the same name as I would, as I do, and in fact his father would also have the same name. We'll see, it's Joseph Smith Jr. That's the same name, Joseph. Uh, and as a patriarch. And uh, he will, you know, do this all this wonderful stuff. So basically, Joseph Smith writes himself in the Bible in an alleged prophecy given by the patriarch Joseph. He also revises the Bible where it doesn't agree with his theology as it was at the time, which is the early 1830s. So you know John 1, 1 probably by heart, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Joseph rewrote that to say, in the beginning was the Gospel preached through the Son. And the Gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. You say, well, where did he get all that? 
Now, since just when Joseph Smith did this, it seemed plausible to maintain that lots of stuff just got accidentally dropped out of John Allen. Student copyists took a copy of it. Left parts of it out. And the hope, the expectation was that more manuscripts were discovered, you could find the missing stuff. That's not what happened. Instead, what happened was, as more manuscripts were discovered, we found out that the King James Version had a little bit of extra stuff. And that we hadn't lost anything. <laughs> if anything, the King James was about 102% of the Bible. But we hadn't lost anything else to make things. Joseph, at this point, did not agree with the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. And so he re rewrote Romans 4 5. Which says uh, that God justifies uh, the ungodly. He changes it to say uh, that He justifies not the ungodly. There goes the gospel. It's got to bring that. If you want to be justified, you've got to be godly. Well, hey, if I'm godly, I don't need to be justified. I already am. Godly people don't need to be justified. This is how Jesus put it I did not come to call the righteous. Sinners. By the way, Keisha wondered, did Jesus teach this doctrine? He absolutely did. <laughs> he absolutely did. Jesus came to save sinners. Paul said the same thing in the All right, so by the way, Joseph did this in a few places. He added the word not, but he thought he was fixing the problem in the Bible. Another scripture in the uh, standard works that they're called in Mormonism is called the Doctrine and Covenants. Joseph issued most of the revelations that show up in this book in the first two years of the church, 1830 to 1832. In 1833, they were published as what was called the Book of Commandments. Uh, later on, uh, it was expanded slightly and some things were dropped. It was called, it was called Doctrine and Covenants in 1835. Doctrine and Covenants in 1835 included a lengthy series of lectures on basic Mormon doctrine, which at the time was not as radically off as it is now, or even as it would be five years later. And it was called the Lectures on Faith. They were part of the Mormon scriptures. They were part of Doctrine and Covenants from 1835 until 1921. Now, I just can't resist pointing something out here that's ironic. Mormons talk about good stuff getting lost from or taken out of the Bible. The manuscript evidences that have come in since Joseph Smith have proven that false. Nothing got taken out of the Bible. On the other hand, every Mormon scripture has lost something or had something taken out. The Book of Mormon lost 116 pages. Doctrine and Covenants, they just took out the lectures on the well, why did they come out? Because Joseph's theology had changed and it no longer agreed with what Mormons did not. And when Joseph wrote lectures on faith, he had come to the position that the Father and the Son were separately embodied individuals, the Father for the body of the Spirit and the Son of the body of flesh. Later on, Joseph decided, no, the Father has a body of flesh too. So they had contradictory doctrines in those scriptures almost a century. And in the same scripture, too, they were written the Doctrine and Covenants. And they finally said, hey, that's it. Just get rid of it. And they threw all of the cowboy under the bus said it was his fault. He was, he was the one that wrote it, and it wasn't even Joseph's fault. Joseph Smith oversaw the production of the lectures on faith, and he approved it. That's historical fact. Also in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph added a passage of over 300 words right into the middle of the sentence in an earlier revelation. The earlier revelation was, uh, we're going to stop using wine in communion, we're going to use water instead. And until such time as God says otherwise, that's what we're going to do. Because um, we're not going to buy wine from other wine makers that are not that makes sense. So there. It's water, you know. So it's a really 
totally different subject. Right into the middle of this revelation, Joseph slices into the middle of the sentence a 300 word passage about this supposedly deceiving the priesthood in 1829. The priesthood in Mormonism is the thing that makes them right and you wrong. It's a thing that makes your baptism invalid because you don't have it. You weren't baptized with somebody who has the priesthood and makes their baptisms of God. It's an authority from God to do the ordinances, to preach the gospel, to have church. You can't have the church and do what God wants you to do in the church without the priesthood. The problem is Joseph Smith didn't have the priesthood in 1829. He didn't have it in 1830. He didn't have it in 1831. He didn't even talk about having it. But what happened was, as the years went on, he started to have some struggles for maintaining control of the church. So he said, listen guys, years ago, John the Baptist, John the Baptist appeared to me at Oliver and laid hands on us and baptized us. Oh, man. We had these three guys appear to us, these three apostles, and they laid hands on the first century, and they laid hands on us and gave us the priesthood. And you can't be in charge or have anything to say about what happens anywhere in the church without the priesthood. If you haven't got it, you're out. And we have it. And you don't, unless you let us do it. So it was a way of getting control. I said, I can't believe that he would try to do that and get away with it. Here's the text. The black words here at the beginning and end are a single sentence in the 1833 Book of Commandments. The blue text is all the text that Joseph has been added two years later in 1835 in Doctrine and Covenants. It's all one ridiculously long sentence. That he spliced into the middle of a short sentence, a regular sentence, to backdate a statement about having received the uh, through these individuals. And these are available online. You can look at Book of Commandments, the uh, actual photo stats of it, and then look at the 1835 edition and today's edition, and you can see that. <coughs> In 1832, Joseph Smith preached, uh, he predicted in one of his revelations that a temple would be built on a lot that the church had purchased uh, in Missouri. Uh, this is a sign outside the, uh, in front of the lot that they had purchased. A temple was supposed to be built there before Joseph's generation passed away. This was written in 1832. The land is now owned by the community of Christ, which used to be called the New York Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and no temple was ever built there. I, in my study, I've run across about a dozen different explanations from Mormons as to why this prophecy didn't come true. I have an article that tediously goes through all 12 uh, But the point is that there's no temple. A funny story, I talked to some Mormon missionaries, this must have been 25, 30 years ago. And I brought this up. I said, there's this false prophecy in, in Doctrine and Covenants 84 about, about a temple being built on the on this lot in, in Independence, Missouri, and it was never built there. And I said, oh, yes, it was. And I said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> oh, yes, it was. I said, look, that's not how it is. You go find like, a picture of something, you go find some documentation that the temple was there in Independence, Missouri, and I'll take that. <laughs> they're supposed to come back to the United States, they didn't show up, and that's what they didn't show up. And they finally showed up. And they said, yeah, there's a temple there. There's no temple there. But it's still not false prophecy. But even though I had extracted from them an agreement that if it hadn't been built, there would be a false prophecy. I would come back and say, no, it's not a false prophecy. Something about forces and water comes to mind. Unfortunately, sometimes people just don't want to deal with the truth. Another revelation in Doctrine and Covenants is the most notorious of all, a revelation called Doctrine and Covenants 132, in which Joseph claimed God was commanding him and others, but mostly him, to practice polygamy. And the, I'm giving you the quick and dirty version of it here. If you went along with it, 
didn't become gods. You didn't go along with it. You were the son. You had to support Joseph. And toward the end of the prophecy of the Revelation, Joseph has the Lord telling Emma, you go along with this now. You support Joseph. Emma's his one legal wife. You don't fight him on this. Support him. He's, he's my man. He's just doing this because I told him to. You don't. I'm a real man. Talk about the manipulation. Um, Joseph issued his prophecy secretly in 1843. And every trouble keeping track of the dates, I totally get that. This is a year before he's dies. This is 13 years after he started the church and after he wanted to be born. By about 1841, he began taking a bunch of wives. Some 30 or more wives. Uh, there's a couple of women that people are not sure about at this point. But mo most of them were, were not really sure that he did and you know what the date was. That he was sealed. About a dozen of them were married legally to other men living at the time. They had legal husbands. Another dozen or so were teenagers. Two of them were about 14 years old. Now, it used to be you talked to a woman about this and they would No, Joseph was a good man. He would never do that. No, he must be mistaken. Well, he may have taken women into his home, you know, who were widows, and, you know, all women that didn't have anywhere to go. A couple of years ago, the LDS Church published an article on their website. The reason why they did this, and they have a bunch of articles like this now, including one on the Cedar Stone I talked about that earlier, is because of the internet. Used to be, if you wanted to know what was really the facts about the history of Mormons, you had to get some poorly mimeographed document from an ex Mormon in Salt Lake City who would mail it to you if you asked for it. Or you had to go there and ask for it. Now, in the last 10 years or so, all this stuff is available on the internet. Anybody can find it. Anybody can talk about it. And the Mormons were scared. We've got to see something about this. Because now the facts are too easily accessible. So they came out with a bunch of articles on these controversial subjects, including this one, discreetly called Plural Marriage in Kirtland and non -Bury. Now, what this really should be called is Joseph Smith's Plural Wives. That's what the subject is. They admitted this article that Joseph married multiple wives and also got some other men to do the same thing. They admitted that he had sex with at least some of them. They're not very specific. A footnote even admits that it is possible he fathered two or three children with plural wives. Now, I think that one is still arguing. And maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. We don't, we can't prove that yet. But he could have, according to the youngest church. The youngest was 14 years old when she was here with Joseph. They also admit that a number of the women were already married, uh, and the actual number is somewhere around 12 or maybe 14. The husbands were still legally wed to them at the time. Now, the last gas pope of Mormons to save Joseph's chastity is to say he didn't have sex with any of those women, but he could have had sex with the teenage girls and the single women. By the way, some of these women came in pairs, mother and daughter, sister and sister. There were like three or four of these pairs of women that were closely related in relationships that Leviticus says, uh -huh. <laughs> When we talk about marriage, plural marriage or polygamy, okay, but you can't marry a woman and a daughter. That, that's out. And Joseph did that. So he said, well, he's just going by the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament says a lot of that. Now, he probably took the bond as well as the daughter because he wanted the daughter. That's not what he did. If he takes the mother, she can't complain. <clears throat> Joseph would go to these girls, his men, most of them were girls, and he would say to his men, or their parents, their, 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 yeah, the girls' parents, he would say, I feel very uneasy about this, and I, I'm just sick, but the Lord has told me that I must do this. In fact, I have resisted it, but an angel of the Lord appeared to me in one account with a flaming sword and threatened to kill me if I didn't be 
your or your daughter with me, my wife. Now, there would be no there would be no angst or anything like that if all he was asking them to do was, I want you to be part of my sort of extended family, like a, a beloved niece, and there's there's no sex involved. In fact, you can marry somebody else if you wanted. We're using the term wife in a, in a spiritual sense only. That, that was not the case, because if that had been the case, there would have been no need for all this anguish and, and, and stress and, and, oh my gosh, you know, I'm really sorry, but, you know, uh, I know this is asking a lot, you know, and there would have been none of that. And by the way, sometimes he would tell the families and the girls, if you agree to this, you will secure salvation for your whole family. Now, talk about a pickup. And Joseph was just the kind of guy that could pull this off. And I don't know if you want, if you listen to you, you're probably like, I can't believe it, I can't believe it, I can't believe it, I can't believe people believe that, I can't believe people went along with that. But Joseph was the kind of guy who could convince you to do anything. He was, the world is heavy like this, they're just so charismatic, they're so personal. And they explain it in such a way that you just feel like, oh my gosh, can I please do what you asked? I would love to do that thing. And you just have that power over people. I, I, I'm, I'm recording this as somebody who definitely does not, okay? I can't even understand how somebody could be like that, but he was. He just had that magnetic personality. He was proud to make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> actually, he did. Uh, toward, the end, toward the end, he thought those were, but toward the end of his life, he actually declared himself as a candidate for the presidency of the United States. And that was one of the things that he did that led to his downfall. I'm not making that up either. Really <laughs> Needs to be a trip over a truth. <laughs> Alright, now, another uh, scripture called the Pearl of Great Christ, it was called it after Joseph died. It was Little hodgepodge collection of very short things that he wrote. One of these was a history of his life and work, and only a small excerpt was taken from that history and put into the Mormon scriptures. It is known as Joseph's Ministry. This very short little book, uh, I believe in commenting on this most of the way, because it's a short little book about uh, the, the coming to be a book of Mormon. But before that, before he gets into the Book of Mormon story, Moroni, the angel appearing in his bedroom, and all that stuff. He talks about how he had a vision or a visitation from God the Father and Jesus Christ three years before Moroni showed up in 1820 when he was only 14 years old. And supposedly the Father and the Son appeared to him in bodily form, visibly as two separate personages, and they spoke to him. And this was in response to a prayer that he said he had made when he went out to the verse to pray and asked God which church to join. By the way, he had a parent down in three. The Methodists and the Presbyterians were two main ones, and the Baptists were a distant third. And then you had to carry down the rest of the Catholics were even in the And God, uh, Jesus told him to join none of the churches, they were all off. So this is a story that he told in this book, a uh, short little uh, excerpt from this long book that he produced in 1838, 1839, of uh, his own history. And this is the first time, and it was published a few years later, it was the first time. First time anybody ever heard about God the Father appearing in Joseph's life. And I don't think I've ever heard that before. <clears throat> um, I'm going to skip over the historical problems with the first vision. I've already touched on one. Uh, theological problems where we have to testify scripture. Uh, the Son is embodied in human form, but not the Father. Uh, and Joseph's claim that Jesus told him that all the churches were wrong flies in the face of the New Testament teaching that Christ found the church and would continue to guide the church until the end of the age. And that the 20, 1820s, a good text on that, as well as some of others. Now, now we come to the peace state of the systems. Or, as critics of the Mormon church like to call it, the smoking gun. It's called the Book of Abraham. Now, one problem that we have with the Book of Mormon is we don't have gold plates. If we only have gold plates, we have Egyptologists now. In fact, the Mormons have Egyptologists now. You don't have to be inspired. Now you can just read it if it was still legible. And see if it actually says something like what we have in the Book of 
Now, we can't do that because we have the whole place. But when you claim to be a father, and the may I say, say, when you aren't really a father, but you claim to be one, and you're constantly struggling to get people to believe that you've got something going, you've got your mojo, you've got your stuff, right? You have to keep coming up with new stuff. And Joseph in 1835 had the church buy some papyri and mummies that had some papyri stuck in them uh, that were being brought along by a child in sales in 1835. But he claimed, he identified the scrolls, the papyri scrolls in the mummies as the writings of Abraham and Joseph in the book of Genesis. Genesis Patriarch. They're actual writings. And so in 1835, the church bought the papyri and he began, began producing this translation. He worked on it off and off. He, he took the colleagues for a long time and finished up as much as he got them, which he never finished. But he, as much as he got them in 1842, here again, a Mormon scripture of this incomplete. Joseph criticizes the Book of Mormon Bible for supposedly being incomplete. Every Mormon scripture is incomplete. So he publishes this incomplete text, the Book of Abraham in 1842. This is a, a, an image, a reproduction of the, of the first page of the article in which the translation appears. And it says up here, a facsimile from the Book of Abraham, number one. And this is a, a, a drawing Joseph has uh, in his work as a document, a little bit, but it's a, it's a reproduction of a drawing on the papyrus scrolls. Now, these uh, papyri scrolls were lost for over a century and presumed to have been destroyed in a fire in Chicago. Uh, but then large fragments of this one scroll uh, showed up in the 1960s and were eventually returned to the LDS Church. Mormon scholars who were Egyptologists, uh, or at least budding Egyptologists, did their best to translate them. Egypt, uh, Don among the Egyptologists also translated and by the way, now the ones do have some bona fide PhD Egyptologists. And they produce their own translations. And all the translations generally agree on what it says. And they agree that what it is is an Egyptian pagan funeral text called the Book of Greetings. And it doesn't say anything about Abraham at all. This is why we call this the smoking gun, because unlike the Book of Mormon, they actually have the original text. With the actual diagram that Joseph said was a representation of an Egyptian pagan priest trying to offer Abraham on an altar in the sacrament, human sacrifice. And this is the image here. Joseph Smith, uh, doctor of the type of said, part of it was torn or illegible. And so he fixed it so it looked like there was this Egyptian priest who was trying to sacrifice Abraham laying on an altar. And uh, this is supposedly the Holy Spirit coming to rescue Abraham from this uh, martyr. This is how Egyptologists reconstruct the picture. The figure here has the head of Anubis. He's a priest, indeed, wearing a mask of Anubis because he's going to perform a ceremony in which the Egyptian man is going to have his uh, soul uh, uh, guided uh, to the afterlife. Stop throwing, it's all you can. And so all of the non Mormon Egyptologists agree that this diagram does not represent anything to do with Abraham. Only the Mormons, though, try to argue that it is because the Father should have stopped it because it's in Joseph Smith's sacrifice. According to the Book of Abraham, God was in another world near a star called Koa. Uh, a plurality of gods made the earth by organizing it. No creation ex nihilo or out of nothing. God makes the world out of pre existent matter. We are all made out of pre existent matter, that we are all eternal beings of some form or other. Book of Abraham also claims that it was God's idea to preserve us alive about being only Abraham's sister uh, in order to hide the truth that she was Abraham's wife. It turns out. That Joseph produced this part of his quote unquote translation of the book of Abraham uh, at the same time as he was taking multiple wives. So basically, he had created this trust that God said he had to protect the prophets. 
back then, and that's what you need to do now. You need to lie if necessary to protect the profit. Law. <laughs> it wasn't too long after he published that book of Abraham that he was killed for various reasons. He had the polygamy, uh, the threat of actually dying for the presidency, and perhaps, who knows, you know, they were worried about that. A number of things. Even people would order in the newspaper to be destroyed and criticized it. It's not actually not an investment. And then a mob decided to make Joseph a martyr. Thanks, guys. <laughs> they stormed the jail and killed Joseph and one of his brothers. Uh, there was a gunfight. This is, you know, the old west, you know, at that time. And, uh, and uh, but, so they thought that, that they were killed. And Mormons knew Joseph as a lamb who went to the slaughter. I never knew a lamb who shot back. He, he shot two or three people, right? In yeah, he wounded one or two uh, people and then killed the guy. Mm -hmm. and but, now, John Taylor, one of uh, the Mormons who actually added something to the Doctrine of Covenants, uh, said, Joseph Smith, the prophet, the seer of the Lord, has done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in. Essentially, Mormons view Joseph Smith the way Muslims view Muhammad. That is a totally fair comparison. But I will say, in a way, it's unfair to Muhammad. Now, why do I say that? Muhammad grew up in a pagan polytheistic idolatry culture. And he actually advanced to a form of monotheism. And had some ethics that he had, you know, insisted upon that were contrary to his Jewish culture. So he took a step forward. Now, of course, claiming to be a prophet, everything he said got turned into stone as the word of God forever. So when he did not rise above this culture, Islam will never rise above it unless they just abandon it. Meanwhile, Joseph Smith, centuries later, lives in a predominantly Christian, at least dominant Christian culture, monotheistic, monogamous culture, and he takes a couple of giant steps backward to bring back polygamy and polytheism. So I, I, in some ways, I think the comparison is not fair to mine. Now, there are four scriptures or standard works of Mormonism. We've talked about all these the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pro and Great Christ. They don't agree theologically, don't try to make them agree theologically. The Mormons have done the best they could to try to figure out a way to synthesize these, but it ends up being a theology that Joseph never taught. Joseph Smith's theology changed radically in the 15 years that he claimed to be a prophet. He started off as a monotheist, and you see this in the Book of Mormon and early revelations and Doctrine and Covenants. He then became some kind of a bi-interior or bi-theist, di-theist. The Father, the Son, and two separate divine personages united in one mind, which is the Holy Spirit. Then, that's the Doctrine of Lectures on Faith. That's why that had to get taken out. That didn't last. Then, uh, he became a rank polytheist for the last uh, eight years or so of his life. Seven eight years of his life. Uh, it, and you see this showing up in the latest revelations of Doctrine and Covenants in the book of Abraham, which talks explicitly about God's organizing the world. And in a couple of sermons that never got into the form of scriptures, but that guidance has been thinking for most of church history since then. Which I wish I had time to go into those, but I won't. <laughs> um, so Joseph originally taught that there is one God, uh, he basically sounded like a Trinitarian. Uh, that God has always been God, uh, that he alone created the world, one God created the world, and that to be saved, you had to accept God's grace in this life. He also taught monogamy. By the end of his life, he was contradicting all of those doctrines. To summarize here a few things that we've talked about. Mormons accept the idea that open canon scripture, scripture can be added to at any time. In view. In practice, 99% of the scriptures one would accept, other than the Bible, were produced by Joseph Smith. Revelation, at least that was added to scripture, slowed to a crawl after he left. Reading revelations can be rewritten, added, dropped, even contradicted by later revelations. Okay. God's love, you know, make adjustments or whatever. 
The Bible is considered to be the word of God, but it's incomplete, unreliable because of all the copying mistakes that would have been made. Uh, I have tried to argue briefly that the supposed ancient scriptures that Joseph claimed were transmitted from the Mormon to Abraham in particular are not authentic ancient texts at all. They are books that sound Christian and are in significant measure plagiarized from King James Version of the Bible. Joseph's body revelations reflect his own radically evolving theology and practices. From a biblical perspective, I, as a Bible reading evangelical Christian, conclude that Joseph Smith was a false prophet. Now, this does not mean that Mormons are bad people in terms of you know, our culture or whatever. Mormons are generally very, very nice people, very good citizens. And some of them are not nice, but some Christians are not nice, right? Some evangelicals are not nice. Uh, but uh, Mormonism uh, is not a true form of Christianity. Uh, this is our website, irr.org. Uh, we have an increasing amount of materials that are showing up here on various subjects related to Mormonism and also just stuff on biblical studies. For example, you will find uh, the most exhaustive reviews of study Bibles and of Bible study tools like Bible apps and so forth. Anywhere on the web, you'll find that on our website. On the Book of Mormon, we are, I am developing a Book of Mormon printed text, which is going to be the entire Book of Mormon from the 1830 printed edition with collections based on our earlier and older manuscripts of the Book of Mormon and comparisons with the King James Version showing, you know, People can see exactly what Joseph Smith did with the Bible. Uh, we have a bunch of other stuff on there that might be of interest. So, anyway, that's what's on our website. Uh, thanks for your patience as I've gone well over time. And uh, yeah. I don't think we can just sit around and talk or whatever. Uh, where do you want to do this? Sure. Well, let's thank Rob for, you know. It's a bit like, uh, feel a bit like drinking from a fire hose with all that, but, and, and there's so much more that could be said, but, um, yeah, this, uh, interesting stuff and really appreciate you coming out. Uh, so, yeah, we are a little over time, so I think we're just going to wrap things up. Would anybody like to pray to end this here tonight? Okay, well, I guess I'll go ahead and do that then. Lord God, we just thank you for this time here tonight. We uh, we thank you for the uh, the wisdom and the, the knowledge that you've you've given to Rob and God. We just pray that we can go out and uh, and use this information to further your kingdom, God. And I pray that uh, you would continue to um, watch over this group and guide this group and help us uh, with all we do. And uh, may we follow you in doing your will. And God, we just pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Would you mind if I say something a little bit? Sure. I, this was kind of fire hose treatment, and I, I, I know that. And you're not going to remember all this stuff. But uh, first of all, I hope that you sort of follow the story and understand kind of the big picture of Joseph Smith and what these different books are that, that are in Mormonism and where they came from. I think you've got a general understanding of that. You can find this information on our website. The specifics uh, is, is pretty much all there. Um, as far as uh, when you're talking with Mormons, just think through that a couple of things. One is that they very often will use Christian language, New Testament language, and they very often import different meanings to things. So you need to ask, well, what do you mean by that? Well, how do you understand the nature of God? Do you believe, do you believe God is an incorporeal or bodiless spirit? Oh, no, you believe he has a body of flesh and bones. Well, believe God the Son took on human form and became a man before that God was simply spirit. And so just to be able to understand that they will use biblical language, they will use Christian language, um, and very often use something different. And they're not trying to be accepted. This is how they've been taught to understand the language. Uh, I want to emphasize that most Mormons do not deliberately try to deceive people. Now, if you mean Mormon intellectually, that's a different situation. Because very often they know stuff that they will not be forthcoming about unless they, you know, they realize they can't get away with it. Then all of a sudden they know. So you'll meet people, and even even non-elections now, you will find them saying things like, "Oh, I've already, 
のもう一度また心に伝えました。ここ見て。We don't do that anymore, so that's what we're doing. Don't see this like that. But it wasn't only a few years ago that Mormons were scandalized if he suggested that Joseph actually had four wives. So, there's a disconnect there. So just be aware of the fact that, that there, there could be some gamesmanship there. There could be, they've been taught, this is how you answer these things. And they have been, they've been told, okay, if, if somebody brings up polygamy, here's the things you can say. Well, that was a practice. And we don't do that anymore. And, uh, you know, it was no different than what Abraham did in the Old Testament. So, Abraham practiced serving motherhood with his wife's name. He did not take plural wives. <laughs> Short answer to that. Hitler was a servant of not, not a wife, not, not a servant. Um, and yeah, there were polygamists in the Old Testament, but they weren't taking mothers and sister pairs and, you know, all this stuff and lying about it and cheating and, you know, deceiving and making crazy claims like if you do this, you'll guarantee salvation to your whole family. And, and God never told the boy that God trusted him. Practice never connected. So just know that there's certain things that they're going to say about any subject like this. And if I could suggest a couple of subjects to zero in on that are especially important to sort of poke a hole in the Mormon's confidence in their church, polygamy would be an issue. The Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham would be an issue. Because that is kind of a smoking gun that Joseph wasn't really an inspired translator. He's supposedly translated in this Book of Abraham, and it's really a document from 2,000 years later about dying the spirit of Egyptian pagans in the afterlife. So, going by what Mormons themselves have testified were scandalous to them and made them really question, those two would be big ones. One other thing I'd like to say before we stop, at least this, me talking out loud about this. When Mormons lose faith in Mormonism, they very typically lose faith in Christianity as well. They have been taught that Christendom is apostate, it's evil, it's corrupt. Yeah, they're nice people, but they don't know God. They don't even know what the purpose of life is. They believe all this jumbo of the Trinity and stuff. That's, that's, that's not Christian, that's not right, or whatever, whatever word they use. And I would never go to that. And they've been taught, why do has all this weird stuff that, that can't be understood. So if you, if you can't accept the Book of Mormon, how could you possibly accept the Bible? I mean, the Bible is harder to understand, harder to accept. The Bible is harder to understand, because it actually is an ancient book. <laughs> so most of you are hard to understand. People don't understand that very often. They think the Bible should have been easy to understand by 19th century Americans. It wasn't written to them. It was written to people thousands of years earlier in a different language. So we're going to have some hermeneutical issues and have some work to do to understand the Bible. So, but the point I'm making is Mormons have been basically trained to think if I give up on Mormonism, I'm basically giving up on God, Jesus, the whole ball of wax. So the typical ex-Mormon becomes a skeptic or an agnostic. They, they get all upset about issues like same-sex marriage. All of a sudden they're for it because they just lost all their theological and moral norms. They've got nothing to tell them what's right and wrong except the culture. And so they fall into the path of least resistance. So a big part of our ministry, not our own, is trying to catch them as they're on their way out and say, don't do that. Don't let your losing faith in Joseph Smith and the Elders Church cause you this faith in God. God is real. Jesus rose from the dead. These things are true. Not everything you were told was and so that's a big part of what we do. And so when you talk to a Mormon, it's almost more important to talk up Jesus and the Bible to make sure that you're not just tearing down. I'm not saying don't poke the holes, because I think we have to poke the holes. But I always try to poke the hole in a way that brings the truth about. So I say, you know, the book of Abraham isn't what's on the manuscripts, but the Bible is. We don't have the gold plates, but we have the major codices and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the rest of it in the original languages. So I try to draw this 
We don't, no one saw Joseph Smith seeing God the Father and Jesus Christ except Joseph if we saw him. But there were all these people that saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. Men and women, believers and unbelievers, I mean, you name it. So I always try to make those comparisons because I don't want the Mormon to become a non-Christian and become a skeptic. I want them to become a Christian. And so, you know, we've got to do the positive side of it. So you see how I'm trying to illustrate how you can do that at the same time. You don't have to do one or the other, you can do both. And we have some resources on our website that I think are helpful in that way. Yeah. Sorry, I went on the floor. I just, I felt like if I just stopped with all the information and not what to do with it, it would be. Yeah.